Hello, so in this video we're going to be looking at the two models of agro demand and agro supply and then we're going to be looking at the factors which cause agro demand and agro supply to shift. So before we start, let's quickly remind ourselves of what is agro demand and what is agro supply. Agro demand is the total uh, value of goods and services demanded in an economy and agro supply is the total amount of goods and services supplied or produced in an economy. And for this video, we're going to be looking at agro demand is just a normal curve sloping downwards, but we're going to be looking at the short run and long run agro supply and how they look like in the Keynesian model and how they look like in the classical model. So, let's start with the Keynesian model. This is what the agro supply looks like. You have a horizontal bit, then you have a bit which curves up, and then you have um, a vertical bit. Now, I tend to use the Keynesian diagram for my videos, but this is simply because it's easier and it's a better way to explain. However, it's important to know both ways because when you're evaluating, you might want to say that what I've just said is correct, but it assumes that we are using a Keynesian, um, uh, a Keynesian model or it assumes I'm using classical model, however there is another model which exists and actually there are several models which exist. So, this, um, this aggregate supply curve is comprised of three sections. The first section is the horizontal bit. This is called spare capacity. Now, what this means is that resources in an economy are not fully utilised. So there is land, labour, capital, all floating around which is not being used. So what this is saying is that as you increase your productivity and you use more and more of these land labour capital, when you are on the spare capacity bit, price level will not change. Why? Because supply outweighs demand. You have a lot more supply of labour, land, capital, enterprise than people who are demanding it. Then you reach this curve bit, which sort of curves up. And this is called the bottleneck. Now this is when we start to see a shortage in resources like uh, land, labour, capital and enterprise, this is when things, the price starts to increase as we increase our output because um, commodities and other factors of production, they start to get expensive because supply starts to fall and demand um, is always increasing. Then you have this vertical bit, now this is called full employment. This is where all the resources are utilised. So if you put any policy like increase government spending or increase consumption and you try to increase aggregate demand, basically your real GDP is not going to increase because you have all the resources which are already fully employed. So all that you have is inflationary pressures from an increase in price level. So this is basically clear and the important point to note here is that this aggregate supply curve can be used in both the short run and the long run. For Keynesian economists, it's the same thing, there is no distinction. What they say is that in the long run, you can have spare capacity, you can have bottleneck, and you can have full employment. It can be any one of those. Whereas now, when we look at classical, we'll see it's not like this. So, let me rub this out, and then we'll draw another diagram. Now, classical economists, they differentiate between long-run anchor supply and short-run anchor supply. So what I'll do is I'll draw two diagrams to um, depict this. I won't draw the aggregate demand curve because it's just a normal curve sloping downwards. So again, on the y-axis you have price level, and on the x-axis you have real GDP. So in the short run, there is like a curve going up, like a normal supply curve, and then things become vertical. You can kind of see how both of these actually match and you could draw them on one diagram because it would look like this if you drew it on one diagram. Just a line and then a vertical line coming this way. Okay, so let's have a look. Now what they are saying, classical economists, is as you increase your output in the short run, so you use more and more resources because you need to use resources in order to increase productivity which increases GDP and therefore economic growth. So you increase that, then prices increase. There is no such thing as no inflationary pressure. You will have it. You even start off a particular price, you don't start off at zero. And so you increase. 
you reach a point then when actually your real GDP will not increase any further so just like um, uh, full employment in Keynesian um, uh, model in the Keynesian model you, uh, you reach a point where it's just constant so GDP doesn't increase just price level does and this translates into the long run aggregate supply which is basically just a vertical curve the classical uh, model is basically just like having the so there's been a bit of a technical difficulty that's why I've merged the two videos so let me just finish off what I was saying what I was saying is that Basically, the classical model is just like the Keynesian model, except it's only the bottleneck and the full employment, if you like to think about it like that. It's an easy way to remember it. And the other thing that is really important to remember is that when you have the classical model, you can only have full employment in the long run. Why? Because it's vertical, it's inelastic and it's constant. It's just a line, basically. Remember that. Whereas in the Keynesian, you can have spare capacity, you can have bottleneck in the long run because that same curve which is used in the short run is used in the long run. Okay, so that's what I want to finish off there. Now I wanted to talk about the shifts in aggregate demand and aggregate supply. So let's start off with aggregate demand. Now all of these factors, there's about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of these factors which I've got with me, they all will relate to one component of aggregate demand. So either consumption, investment, government spending or exports minus imports. So we're going to talk about them in terms of that because you can relate it back to the aggregate demand formula and it makes more sense than just talking about it like, you know, randomly. So the first factor we're going to be looking at is tax levels. Now tax levels they impact aggregate demand through consumption and investment. If tax levels are too high then consumers will not have that much to spend because the disposable income shrinks and it's the same for investment. If tax levels are too high they don't have profit and stuff to reinvest in capital etc. So therefore aggregate demand would fall because C plus, uh, plus I would also fall. But then again, you could think about it this way, that if tax levels go up, government revenue goes up, and then government spending would go up, and therefore aggregate um, demand would go up. However, this relies on the fact that actually everybody pays their tax, because if uh, the companies and firms here, they may move elsewhere if tax levels are too high. The second point is exchange rates. They affect aggregate demand. Now, simply, I've got other videos on this mechanism of exchange rates affecting exports and imports. But basically, what happens is, if the pound becomes very expensive, it appreciates, then people sitting in Europe, they can't buy that many pounds for the euro anymore. They buy, they can only buy less um, pounds for the euro. So what happens is they can only um, import so much. They can't import as, mu as much as they could before because they can't afford it basically. And so that causes exports to fall. And the opposite happens to us in the UK. Our pound can now buy $5 instead of 2 So that means we have more dollars when we go to the States and we can buy lots more things there. We can import more from there. So that's how it works. So what you got to remember is a strong pound means that you are net importing and a weak pound means that you are net exporting. So that's and so if you have if you're net importing, then that causes aggregate demand to fall because it's a minus. And if you are net exporting, then that causes aggregate demand to increase because that's uh, um, that's like addition to the formula. Then you have foreign direct investment. Well, if firms are um, coming here from overseas investing here, capital I is basically increasing. If I is increasing, then so is aggregate demand. So that's how FDI affects um, aggregate demand. Then you have expectations. Now, this is the good to do with spectators, consumer confidence, business confidence. If you are not sure about the economy's state in the future, you will not spend, you will save. So consumption falls. Firms are not going to go and buy like millions of pounds worth of capital. They would rather save it so that if something bad happens in the future because the economy is unstable and the future is unknown, um, then they've got the backup money for a rainy day. And so this is how um, confidence basically is to do with um, expectations and consumer business confidence can affect aggregate demand. The next factor is asset prices. Now, I've written here wealth effect because basically what I mean by asset prices, if house prices goes up, 
most people live in a house and if they find out their house is now worth more then they think oh i'm richer and they go out and they spend the money so that's called the wealth effect and the same happens if house prices fall and the same as you can talk about spectators and investors who have invested in commodities so say you've invested in a certain amount of shares if the shares go up then you are likely to think that you're richer and spend the money even though you haven't sold it you know psychological you would spend the money so it's to do it can um consumption and investment again increasing or falling causing aggregate demand to increase or fall here i've just written capital g because basically at the moment the coalition government is reducing government spending so what's going to happen aggregate demand's going to fall if they were increasing it then aggregate demand would fall it's all to do with the government and how much they choose to spend and that spending will denote aggregate demand and it will denote whether it shifts or uh, which way it shifts or whether it doesn't shift or not interest rates well i have a video on the monetary policy um monetary transmission uh, mechanism but basically what happens is if interest rates are really high then um, consumers have less of a disposable income because they have to spend more money paying interest on their loans, mortgages, etc. So they spend less consumption falls. If interest rates are high, then it's harder for firms to actually go and um, uh, get a loan to spend on capital, infrastructure, etc. The other thing is that if the interest rates are high, then firms might be like, oh, I'm going to get more return from if I save than if I buy capital machinery. And same for consumers, if they got the money, then they would want to save because they get more interest rather than um, actually want to go and spend the money. Okay, so those are the factors affecting aggregate demand. Now let's look at the short run aggregate supply. Now, all of these factors, there's like four, are all basically to do with costs. Different types of costs cause um, shifts in aggregate supply. So aggregate supply will only increase if costs fall and it will decrease if co uh, costs decrease will it will decrease if costs increase yep that's it so the full costs are tax rates because if that that's a cost and if that goes up then obviously um firms have less money to um spend on training and uh, producing and capital equipment things like that so tax rate uh ag Raw material costs, again, you know how that affects a firm, it increases the cost of production. Legislation, so if employment legislation goes up, it's a cost for them to actually hire people who understand the legislation, then implement it. It's, it's another cost of production. And the last one, wage costs, is probably the biggest cost of production. If that goes up through national minimum wage, then um, productivity will fall because, again, firms have less money to spend on labor, um, training the labor, and producing more, etc. etc. So, the four things for short run aggregate supply are simply to do with cost. Whereas long run anchor supply is like if you have a PPF, what is going to cause the actual uh, potential of the economy to increase, the uh, capacity of the economy to increase or decrease? So the first is discovery of raw materials. If you discover new raw materials, supply increases, you, you have more scope to produce more because you have more raw materials and that causes long run anchor supply to increase capital stock if there's new types of capital stock machinery things coming out again there's more scope for you to produce more that's all to do with the long run it's not a cost human capital so if you if um suddenly we see that the labor market is very specialized and skilled so what this means is that um they can actually produce more because they are more sort of skilled and things so basically it's just basically if the labor market is more skilled and everything human capital causes a long run aggregate supply to increase size of the labor force so like we have an influx of migrants in the uk so that that would cause the long run aggregate supply to increase why because there's more potential in the economy to grow and the last is technical change so you know cloud computing internet all these things are causing firms um sorry not firms the economy to grow because there's more potential to grow because there's more availability this technical change allows us to produce more thank you for watching it's quite a long video sorry for the technical difficulty but um please see my blog